Shana Tova, everyone. At home a few weeks ago, my spouse Zach and I were talking about what we might want to do for meals to make Rosh Hashanah special. We talked about the possibility of doing a Rosh Hashanah Seder this year, which is an ancient tradition mentioned in the Talmud and more widely practiced in Sephardi communities now of making foods that have symbolism of some kind associated with the blessings we, we might ask for on Rosh Hashanah. Many of us do a version of this by dipping apples in honey for a sweet new year and eating round challah, symbolizing the cyclical nature of the year and the life cycle. But there are many other traditions like eating pomegranate seeds that our good deeds will be as numerous as the seeds in a pomegranate and more. They also get punnier. I love the idea of this tradition because one, I love the power of food ways as a practice of exploring and internalizing our unique identities, and I love to cook, and I also love a good pun. Honestly, this is like the best nerding out on Judaism and food, two of my greatest passions. But the other reason why I love this is because often the foods we eat lead us to discussing the reality of our lives, the people in our lives, and the important events that connect us to those foods. Last year for Rosh Hashanah, I honestly don't remember what we ate because we had a newborn. Our daughter Lillian was born three weeks before Rosh Hashanah. So this year, we're also starting to think of traditions we want Lillian to grow up with. She'll try apples and honey for the first time this Rosh Hashanah. We also lost Zach's grandmother, Marianne, this year. She was a really special person and a great cook. So as we planned out our meals, we decided it was important to make one of her recipes to honor her memory. So we're having her famous hot water chocolate cake for dessert. Sometimes our individual lived experiences can reflect the associations we have of our communal or calendar cycle. Each year as Rosh Hashanah comes in, we might be in a different place. Certainly this year, we are in a different place. We're pulled between memories of previous years, meals, familiar tunes, people we love, and what feels most relevant or urgent at this time. In fact, our tradition calls it many things, and exploring the names for Rosh Hashanah, I think we can get meaning from it in new ways this very strange and new year. Most years I feel tension between two pairs of these metaphors. First, in the Torah, Rosh Hashanah is not called the first of the year, so if you're not really ready for renewal, it's okay. It's the first day of the seventh month, and it's called Yom Trua, the day of the sounding of the shofar, and Yom Hazikaron, the day of remembrance. Later in our tradition, Rosh Hashanah is also called Yom Hadin, the day of judgment, and Hayom Harat Olam, the day the world was born. Yom Trua, the day of the sounding of the shofar, this might feel like it's the most true, clear definition of Rosh Hashanah. The sound of the shofar is a primal calling out, an urgent message to the divine that we are in distress, in need of repair and care. The urgency of what's going on in our lives, a health pandemic in our country, what's happening on campus, what's happening individually, what's happening in our world, feels deep and intense this year in particular. The shofar blasts are a di direct response to that sense of urgency. Perhaps this is the year we'll feel Yom Trua most deeply in all the years of our lifetime, certainly so far. But Yom Hazikaron, the day of remembrance, alludes to the past, to the distance between our relationship to God, to our request that God remember us, take note of us, as the women who are central to our Torah and Haftorah readings this holiday pray for and receive, and to connect us to our past celebrations of previous years and to the people in our lives who shaped us, even though they may no longer be with us. This year, we are also longing for some of the things that we had, possibly even took for granted in years past, but can only be remembered this year. So with this juxtaposition, Yom Trua and Yom Hazikaron, we hold both the meaning of the past and the urgency of the present. And then we have perhaps a starker contrast between Yom Hadin, 
and Hayom Harat Olam, the day the world was born and the day of judgment. How can we feel both that sense of judgment and simultaneously the sense of delightful possibility in new life? Yom Hadin is very looming and quite stark. This is the day we will all be judged by God. This is the day we take this is why we take the process of change or return so seriously at this time. Take stock, review our shortcomings, pledge to do better. In a year that has been so hard already, we might want to shy away from Yom Hadin, from exploring our shortcomings deeply, from connecting with a God that judges us, that holds us accountable, not to others' expectations, but to being ourselves. Maybe that's a way we can find a path to newness. Since I happened to have a baby near Rosh Hashanah, last year Hayom Harat Olam was all I could think about, but in a really different way. This year, that sense of awe and the beauty of creation at a time when the outside world seems more frightening and when isolation may keep us from getting out or feeling that sense of renewal. Rabbi Angela Buchdahl gives a careful, slightly different take on the translation of Hayom Harat Olam that I really love. The most straightforward word, she says, Hayom, simply means today. Olam can mean world, a word that's been quite familiar from the phrase tikkun olam, repairing the world. But olam can also mean forever or eternal, as in, a phrase, as in the phrase le olam ba'ed. And harat, which we usually see translated as born, comes from the Hebrew word for pregnancy, herayon. So when we pull that all together, the phrase Hayom Harat Olam might translate as today is pregnant with the eternal possibilities of creation. Then she says, how amazing to imagine this Rosh Hashanah posing the sacred challenge that any vision of ourselves, any new identity is possible. This year has actually been one of reinvention, reinvention of relationship, how to stay connected with people in our lives, and reinvention of Jewish life and rituals, knowing that we can't gather in large groups for the things that we normally do to mark time and in the same ways. It's also a time that really requires personal introspection, care for our own inner lives. The challenge of this year requires us to pay better attention to our mental health and our physical health and to the health of everyone around us. And as we spend more time looking inward, Perhaps this is the perfect time to rediscover our own identities and look for meaning in them, to become the sourdough enthusiast you never knew you were, but also to consider the parts of our identities that maybe were hurt or vulnerable, that weren't getting enough attention, and to honor new identities that we come into to help us become more of ourselves. Time is so strange right now. It feels like things are both speeding up and slowing way down, all at the same time. There's a midrash, a rabbinic story, that tells us about time during creation that I'm looking at anew this year. Time is a very interesting thing in the Torah. It doesn't give us often a day-to-day, hour-by-hour rendition of how things happen. At the beginning, however, we are told about the order of creation that it took seven days, and on the sixth day, almost at the end, humanity was created. The Midrash zooms in on the sixth day of creation, where humanity was created. The rabbis give a creative interpretation of what might have happened in the day-to-day of that experience. The day is divided into 12 hours. It says in the first six hours, God is busy creating Adam, the first human from the earth. In the seventh hour, God breathes life into them. In the eighth hour, they are brought into the Garden of Eden. In the ninth hour, God commanded them concerning the fruit of the tree of good and evil. At the tenth hour, they violated God's commandment and ate from the prohibited fruit. At the eleventh hour, they were judged, and at the twelfth hour, pardoned. Said the Holy Blessed One to Adam, This is a sign for your children. Just like you come before me in judgment and I have given you pardon, so too will your children come before me in judgment and I will give them pardon as well. I love this Midrash, this rabbinic story, because it tells us that the limbo, the guilt, the pain of judgment only lasts one hour 
before forgiveness and the chance to repair comes in. In the moment, of course, it feels like forever, but forgiveness, revolution, resolution, connection, all return. To me, this connects Hayom Harat Olam and, Hayo, and Yom Hadin to show that if all that all, if all of this happened in the very first day in humanity, we were new, we made mistakes, we were judged, and we were forgiven. That means we can hold a sense of potential and of responsibility each day, no matter what's going on. And all of this happened before the first Shabbat ever, when we all rest. This Rosh Hashanah, it's also Shabbat. As much as we put a lot of stock and importance on Rosh Hashanah as a high holiday, and as the beginning of the year, we can actually see this year how we might be able to bring a small piece of the joy and meaning of today or this weekend into our lives on a weekly basis with Shabbat. Shabbat can be that much needed break. We all need these days. We need all of these days. We need Yom Hadin. We need Hayom Harat Olam. We need Yom Trua and Yom Hazikaron. And we need them all today. Yom Hadin, let's consider what we are responsible for, what's in our control to change. Yom Trua, if ever there was a time for a primal scream, this is the year for that. Let us be woken from our slumber and let our cries be heard. Yom Hazikaron, let us remember the Rosh Hashanahs of your years past, savor the memories of people or moments that were transformative. This is the day to mourn what we have lost this year and to commit to carry on our memories. And Hayom Harat Olam, the chance to reinvent ourselves and the ways to make meaning in our lives. There is still creative potential in the world. We, with our careful and compassionate self-evaluation, with our awakened sense of audacity and outrage against injustice, we, with our hurts and our tender memories, our vulnerability and our desire for connection, we just might be able to stand at the precipice of 5781 with the hope and determination to make the world more like we want it to be, full of possibility, creative reinvention, and growth. In any case, let's get through it together. May we all find some sweetness in this new year. Shana Tovah.